Good evening, and welcome to the Writer's Block. I'm your host, John Ronan, and as you know now, because we are in our 30th season, I interview writers about their craft, what they're working on, what they've accomplished in the past, what they're planning for the future. It's a broader net than just writers, however. We have had on sculptors, uh, musicians, actors. If you have an idea for an artist of any stripe who might be a good guest for the writer's block, watch for our address at the end of the show. We'd love to get your suggestions. I also want to remind you that the writer's block and all the other original programming produced here at Studio 1623 is a result of cable access television. Don't be suckered in by those dish ads and other ways to get your television content. You stick with cable in the writer's block. Thank you. I'm very happy to say tonight we have a revisiting guest who is a writer and a very well-known naturalist writer specializing in birds. He is Christopher Leahy. You may know that name from Cape Ann uh, speeches he's delivered, or if you're a member of the Audubon Society, from associating uh, him with the society for him. He worked for many years. Chris Leahy retired uh, officially uh, in 2017, 2017, after 45 years as a conservationist with the Massachusetts Audubon Society. He most recently was the Gerard A. Bertrand Chair of Natural History and Field Ornithology. In addition, he has designed and led natural history, history tours to over 80 countries on all of the continents and is especially fascinated by the world's great remaining wilderness areas, hot spots such as Bhutan, Gabon, Madagascar, and Mongolia, about which we'll talk. He grew up in Marblehead, Massachusetts, and he has lived in Gloucester since the 1970s. Current projects include The Invisible Master, The Art and Life of Robert Verity Clem, The Last Wilderness Nation, Artists for Nature in Mongolia, and a historical ecological overview of Mass Audubon's 40,000 acre wildlife sanctuary system. Chris, thanks for being a guest again. Always a pleasure, John. We're going to uh, talk a great deal, I hope, about this brand new book, Birds of Mongolia. I'm going to hold that up so our director, Becky, can get a good shot of that. When did this come out, Chris? It is um, almost literally just out. I just came from a um, huge uh, event that's been going on in the UK for 30 years now called the British Bird Fair, in which thousands, literally thousands of people uh, come from all over the world to uh, partake of everything, everything bird and, and things beyond. Um, and so this book came out just in time to um, have a stand at this, um, at this festival, uh, which was good, very good timing. It seemed to be, if not flying off the shelves, at least, uh, you know, uh, making an impression. So uh, it was very good timing. I'm, I uh, go to this bird fair to represent my Mongolian colleagues. It's a place where I've been doing uh, conservation work and guiding trips for uh, decades, really. And so this is kind of the culmination of a long history um, of mine in Mongolia. And so it was great to have the book uh, there at the festival to be able to. Uh, where I'm curious about where the festival in Britain was. Yes. And, and how many attended this? Right. Well, he, well, here's a little quiz item for you, John, I, because I know you know uh, England well. Do you know what the smallest county in England is? I won't guess. Will I? Okay. Dorset? I don't think so. No. Rutland. And it is very small indeed, and it's about it's sort of central central England. And if you and you know the audience picture in your mind sort of what you think of as the quintessential beautiful English countryside, rolling hills, hedgerows, the occasional castle on a hill, uh, a beautiful uh, lake, Rutland water, that's what it looks like. It's brilliant uh, kind of uh, place. And but th it's also a place which I don't know. Thirty years ago, when the founders of this uh, this festival were looking for a place. My guess is it was like, oh, there's kind of, there's open space and you know, it's not heavily developed, so this would be a good place. L literally not, not realizing that in a couple of decades, there would be literally tens of thousands of people coming to this on a three-day weekend. 
and they are coming from, they are now coming um, from all over the world to advertise their wares, travel programs from Ghana to Argentina to Malaysia, uh, but then people of all birding stripes right. and whatever coming to buy these products and optical equipment and you name it. When I asked that question, I was trying to think of the different huge convention facilities in London, assuming it would have to be at one of those. Yeah. And I bet Rutland wishes they would go to London. Yes, but, but <laughs> that could be. I, I, we have it, although there's no sense of that. It, the, the town in where this is centered is a place called Oakham. And um, uh, we stay, I stay at a, um, a beautiful little prep school there, which is just, again, all of the buildings and everything. It's like a, the classic English place kind of thing. Very, very nice. And so you don't get any sense in the town that the people are like, oh my goodness, the bird people are here. Uh, and there, it's, it all gets put into place. Uh, the, the, uh, the establishment uh, of, this, of the fair are these huge tents, which the, the Brits call, uh, call marquees. Mm -hmm. Huge, vast tents in which there are. There, I think there are eight or 10 of the tents. And then within these tents, uh, there are so-called stands, and that's where um, a given constituency Boots sits, a booth and, kind yeah, of thing. Oh um, and there are just constantly people of all ages, people that can barely crawl, and also you know, young kids with binoculars dangling from their necks and all that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a scene. And over the years, it's also attracted things like, for instance, you can buy, uh, there's, a, there's an explosion of artisanal gins in England right now. And so there's a place where you can go and buy sampling, sample, you know, <laughs> British gins. So. They're not too strict about their qualifications. That's, for, well, it, booth, it, well, anything that supports the birding community, oh, you yes, understand, indeed. yes. <laughs> now, a few time zones east yes. of Rutland yes. is uh, the country of Mongolia. That's right. Uh, tell me about the fascination you have for Mongolia in general and more specifically in connection with the book, Right, the right. birds. Right. Um, well, a, a little a little background on Mongolia. Um, Mongolia is the, the, the place that we are speaking of now is what used to be called Outer Mongolia. There is also an Inner Mongolia that still exists, and that's part of China. Uh, Mongolia, again, the country we're talking about, is sandwiched uh, inconveniently in some cases between um, Russia to the north and China to the south. And in the 1920s, uh, Mongolia became the second communist country in the world because they sought protection, quote unquote, from the then Soviet Union against China, which of course has long been their great enemy. Uh, uh, you know, Genghis Khan was the homeboy from Mongolia. And that's what the Great Wall is all about and that kind of thing. In any case, um, Mongolia was under the, the Soviets until the early 90s when with glasnost and perestroika and things started to fall apart in the Soviet Union, they saw their chance, declared their independence, and they are now a parliamentary democracy with a market economy uh, and doing yeah. quite well. So, um, and, and that's all by way of sort of general background, but it also has to do with how I got there, which was in 1982, um, I was leading, I was scouting. We were invited by the then Soviet Union, who, which were looking for uh, U.S. dollars in those days, this is Brezhnev time, uh, to investigate some of these strictly protected reserves in the Soviet Union that nobody at that point, were, no foreigners were allowed into. And that's a whole story unto itself. But in any case, we, we travel all over the vast country. And um, we, we, of course, wanted to go to places that would normally be off limits to foreigners because you know we're going to wilderness areas and things where yeah. installations might be you know housed and stuff so even though we had bona fides excellent from moscow we'd get to these places in, in the boonies and and the locals would be like well who are these guys really you know and, uh, and so they would just you know no, i'm sorry you are not allowed to go here so but we our in tourist guide um sort of took our part. She liked what we were doing. And so if they turned us down on something, she'd always uh, bargain with them to get something else. So we're at Lake Baikal. And my Russian ornithologist friends would say, well, you must go here and here, and there's wonderful lake here that you must see, and blah, blah, blah. So I, we're all keyed up to do that. And we got to, to Irkutsk. It was like, no, you can't do it. 
So Irkutsk. Irkutsk, yes, yeah, the oh. big city oh, on Lake Baikal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, quite a nice place, or at least it was in 19, well, the last time I was there, it was, I don't know, 85 or something. So anyway, so our in-tourist guide, she, she came, we're licking our wounds, and, and she, um, she came and said, well, I'm sorry that this was a disappointment and you couldn't do what you wanted to do, but how would you like to go to Mongolia? So I'm like, oh, yes, please. And what years are you? This is 1982. I mean, this is, this is before anybody <laughs> went to Mongolia, believe me. So we got on, in those days you flew, in the Soviet Union, you flew most places by night because they didn't want you to see installation, you know. And so we uh, flew at three, 3 in the morning to Ulaanbaatar, which is the capital of Aeroflot special. What's that? Aeroflot uh, well, special. Well, whether it was an army plane or I can't, I can't remember. And um, so we, we went, we spent maybe a week. You couldn't do much then because of, again, restrictions, and uh, they told us a lot of silly it, things. It, during that initial week, yes. did you bird watch? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's, what, that's what it was all about. It was like, oh. Originally, that was the purpose. Well, that was the so, purpose of, of yeah, visiting the Soviet Union, and, then, and the opportunity to go to Mongolia was, yes, it was culturally interesting, and like, I mean, nobody, no gringos had been to Mongolia, so it was like, that was exciting. But no, the purpose was to scout it as a potential birdwatching venue kind of thing, which we did to the best of our ability, and we saw some very interesting things. Enough, and, and I'm sure the, the group didn't, wasn't deeply uh, steeped in the Mongolian birds uh, at well, that Well, again, I didn't have a group with me at this point. This was just me and a, um, a Russian-speaking uh, oh, just, colleague, because uh, oh, we were oh. just scouting in the Soviet okay, Union. Okay. So this was all a scouting trip. So I ended up, uh, I think the year later, two years later, something like that, doing a trip um, that was largely in Russia, what's now in Russia, and with a, you know, with a, a leg, a short leg in Mongolia because you couldn't, couldn't get around much. So um, you make a long story, not too much longer. Um, I didn't go back because you, you, couldn't, you, couldn't, you couldn't do very much. But in the 90s, um, when things opened up, when the, after the bloodless revolution, um, I was invited. There weren't many uh, Americans or Westerners who knew much about Mongolia, and there were Mongolians, including Mongolian Americans, who wanted to go to Mongolia and develop the country in a in a positive way, not you know sort of not exploiting the resources of which there are, are many, uh, but doing a good thing. So I ended up going back to develop a a travel program based on you know natural history, birds, and that kind of thing. And yeah. Yeah, and and you did that. Yep. And then how many how many groups have you led to oh, gosh. Uh, I, uh, uh, Mongolia yeah. since then? Oh well, I've been back since the early '90s, since 1993-94. I've been back pretty much annually, and sometimes more than annually. So you do the math. I don't know, twenty times or something like that. And sometimes going and exploring. One of my uh, demands was that. Um, that for coming back was that I would be allowed to travel all over the country and s scout it because nobody knew. I mean, you knew what the basic geography was, but in terms of bird watching, and it's, I mean, it's an amazing country. It, it, is, it is the least populated sovereign nation in the world, three million people in an area the size of Western Europe. I, re I remember doing a little arithmetic once, and I figured out it's about as, the same uh, density as Australia. Which has many Something more like people, that. but it's yes, bigger. Goes on forever. Yes, well, Mongolia pretty much goes on. It's 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 also a very big place, and forty five percent of the population is in the capital city. So, and the capital city is, although <laughs> now, to my continued astonishment, it has skyscrapers and things like that. But it's very there are no suburbs. It's like here's the capital, and then once you're outside the city limits, which takes some doing given the traffic and stuff. But once you're outside the city limits. You're in the steppe, and and thirty percent of the population are still nomadic herds people. So, so, so the the city, the capital, is uh, about one and a half million, or uh, a, little, a little more. Yeah, a little more. So, yes. so, so it's a substantial city. It's a substantial city. And yes. I'm I'm always interested in in logistic things. Of course. How long does it take you to get to Mongolia? And you go to Boston, London, Moscow. No, you don't have to many of that. Time. There is now a direct flight to from Boston to Beijing, and then from Beijing to UB. Ulaanbaatar is just uh, a couple hours. Oh, so you go the other way. Yeah, you go that. You can go the other way as well. The, there's a, uh, but, um, you know. And so there, that's a yeah, 15 under, hours, 16 hours? Yeah, something like that. And I'll, with groups, taking groups, I'll often, if people have not been to China, 
I'll often suggest um, spending, you know, two or three nights in Beijing and seeing the Great Wall and the Forbidden City, which are very much worth doing, and to observe the great uh, difference between the, the feeling of the Han Chinese culture uh, in China and the Mongolian culture, which are just very, very different, uh, di very different feel. I, I take it you have a love affair with Mongolia, and not just the Mongolian birds, but the, the, the culture and the fact that it hasn't, it sounds like it has not been swept up into the, the treatise of the 21st century. <laughs> exactly, yes. Yes, no, you, you, you've nailed that on both counts. The, um, um, I, when I give talks about Mongolia, which I quite often do, I, the, my subtitle for my lecture is The Last Wilderness Nation. Because again... That's a book you're working on. Because, yeah. well, yeah, um, yes. And um, so, as I, as I say, you're, you're in the countryside and you can travel you know, by Jeep or whatever for hours and never see another person. If you do see another person, it's you know, nomadic herds people or something like that. And the culture is very, the Mongolians are very, it's a Buddhist country, among other things. So the, the Soviets suppressed it, but it's had a great resurgence. And so they are, they're just wonderful people. They're very bright. They're very resourceful because they're nomadic herds people. What they have is living on, on the land or whatever. Uh, they're very welcoming and hospitable. You are expected to stop in. They live in, in yurts or gares, as they call them. Um, and if you're in the countryside and you pass a family group of gares, you're expected to stop and say hi. You know? And you're, <laughs> you're, you're insulted if you do not. That's right. And you're invited in and given you know, some not very good tasting milk tea, as they call it, and things like that. But, um, but wonderful. And so that, um, so I, I now have, I have many friends there and um, it's, it's just a wonderful culture. And no, go ahead. Go I was just going to say that the Soviets, they, they, they did some bad things. Uh, you know, they destroyed hundreds of monasteries and killed monks and you know, nasty stuff. But, but they brought in uh, modern medical care. They brought in education. Mongolians are among the most, it's one of the most literate countries in the world. We're out in the countryside and we'll stop in the schools. They have these boarding schools because it's so spread out. And we'll stop to you know, talk to the kids or whatever. And these kids, they all speak English at some level, uh, in addition to Mongolian, which uh, is better than I do. Um, so, um, you know. So, so I'm understanding your affection for the uh, yeah, country. Yeah, no, it, 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 it's tempted to go. Yes, I well. I, but I want to make sure. Because I'm watching the clock, I want to make sure we talk about the book oh, yeah, yeah. and the Good birds idea. of Magnolia. <laughs> Tell us about this book yes. and okay. the secondarily okay. the birds in it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, the book, the the book uh, has a bit of a tortured history in one sense, in that it uh, my Mongolian co-author, who is a wonderful guy and speaks excellent English, um, but if you've ever had an experience with translation and things like that, he, he literally speaks wonderful English with a Welsh accent because he was trained in bird banding <laughs> in, in Wales, uh, which is great. Um, but when he writes, he writes with a Mongolian accent. <laughs> and there is a skill to writing a book about a, a field guide. You, it needs to be written in a certain style, certain things are included. So, at the beginning of this project, which probably goes back, I don't know, 15 or more years, when before I was involved, I hasten to say, um, there were many uh, co-authors that got involved and then didn't, well, whatever. So I've been involved for the last, I don't know, five or six years, and I take some credit for basically tra you know, translating. I mean, I, I know Mongolian birds quite well uh, myself, but he's, he's you know, the local expert, a professor of ornithology, and, and so we combined our knowledge of the of the avifauna of the bird life. I did most of the, of, and he would do a drafts of things, and then I would translate it into bird English, so to speak, and you know, and add my own pieces Wait, as well. Would you pronounce his name? Your co-author. Gombo Butter Sundev. Gombo Butter. Yes. Sundev. 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 Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, Butter Butter means uh, hero. So a lot of Mongolian names have that in their, in their name, and the name of the capital, Ulan, Ulaanbaatar, means red hero. Uh, and that, of course, is a Soviet you know, reference, you know, red. red did, they, did they give that name to the capital? It's well, the a, Russians. It's the not Ru an the, ancient name. Well, the, no. I mean, hero, Batar is, a, like I say, a common name. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was a way of combining 
you know, a, a honorific, a Mongolian honorific with uh, the Russian flavor kind of thing. But I know uh, uh, this is a, uh, a traditional uh, film uh, bird, bird guide. Um, it covers, I'm reading from a review here, mm -hmm. 503 species. It has many, many, many countless uh, illustrations and uh, gives a uh, summary of uh, identification, voice, habitat, behavior, status, and where appropriate, conservation and taxon right. taxonomy. I don't know if we had so, to open it up and show, because well, all the pages are set up pretty much in the same way. So you have illustrations I'll on see one if I can side. See if, uh, and then on the other side is... you can show this. this all, yeah, yeah, go ahead. This no, side, just, on the, on the, the left side, the text side is... All of those things you just mentioned that talks about how do you identify this bird, uh, and then its status, how common it is. The, in reference to the birds you see on the, the facing birds. page. Exactly. And then there's a map, a color-coded map, that shows you the distribution. Like um, if you can see the green map at the very top, that means that whatever species is, is there it's, it's is there is that well is, is pretty universal, but is also there all year round, ah. um, et cetera. So they're coded, uh, uh, how uh, what is the width, uh, east to west of uh, Mongolia, oh my God. and and the and north north south. That's a good question, uh, which I'm not sure I know the exact answer to. I mean, I know that, you know, the area in general is like the size of Western Europe. is a little bit bigger than Alaska, something like that. What the length is, it must be, I mean, you know, hundreds of miles, whether it's, I don't so, know. So, you know, well, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 miles so east I to west? I, I would guess it's more like, a, I'm, again, it's, somebody's going to call up and say, no, you're totally wrong. But, like, it's more like 1,000 by 600 or something like that. Um, but it's a long, you don't, it's, the, uh, it's, a, it's a two hour plane ride uh, in, a, in a, a jet to cover about two thirds of the country, north to south or something like that. So not a small plane. The, um, the illustrations are countless. I should say also this is all, all these plates and the, the pages are on very heavy duty, uh, I don't know what you call it, plasticized, uh, surface. Yeah, well, uh, so you can say be dunked in water <laughs> and not damaged too much. Which not, no, not so damaged too much. Mongolia, Mongolia's climate is uh, famous or infamous, uh, as it were. You, it, it's called a. The Mongolians say they have. A, it's the land of blue skies. They say, and and that is that is correct. When the skies are blue, they are very blue. Uh, the only issue is that they're they're sort of blue in intervals with, you know, raging snowstorms and things about every hour or so, not, that's an exaggeration, of course, but um, it, it, the weather is, is, is changeable. It's a continental climate so that unlike Gloucester, you don't have the ameliorating effect of the, of the sea. And so the weather is, is very changeable. So we might fly into a given place, uh, in, and this is like May, June, might be the beginning of June, and oh, guess what? All of a sudden there's a blizzard, <laughs> you know? And this often has actually a good effect on birds because these are times when the birds are migrating and bad weather puts the birds down so that you, I've been in places where there are um, hundreds of birds of many different species that have been put down by a storm and they're just like right there and right there and that kind of thing. I was once with a group, uh, we were experiencing one of these fallouts as they say, and one of the members of the group said, he was afraid to open his mouth because he thought a bird would fly in. That's <laughs> so, so it's good. It, the, bird, the birds are smarter than the uh, aviation uh, authorities well, here. Well, often. They, they know when to. Well, they've been doing. Yeah. Well, they've been doing this for flights. a long time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that kind of stuff. But then, you know, in the next two hours or something, the, the snow melts. The wildflowers, the spring wildflowers, are blooming, and so it, you know, sort of. Good news, bad news, but uh, but that's another interesting aspect of Mongolia. Do you Mongolia. do you time most of your visits for oh, spring yes. or summer? Yes. Well, there are several different <clears throat> things. One of the things we should talk about, in addition to the birds, is that in, that people, even people who are fairly knowledgeable about natural history and even birds in Mongolia, don't realize is that it's also one of the best, one of the most amazing countries, temperate zone countries, for large mammals. There are. It has the largest. Uh, this is not Mongolia, but uh, it's the, it has the largest herds of hooved mammals outside of Africa. So there are uh, herds of millions of gazelles in eastern Mongolia. People are like, really? And there are two other species of gazelles. It has bighorn Argali sheep with the biggest horns of any of those sheep in the world. Uh, Siberian ibex. 
the largest concentrations of snow leopards in the world. I was going to say, what preys on these? Animals? Yes, there must be cats. and, and wolves. Got to be big cats and wolves. Oh. Uh, wolves used to be. We we would see wolves on every trip. The herders are not too crazy about the wolves, so they've uh, they're declining a bit, but uh, they're still still quite common. So. Uh, yeah, it's you, uh, it's you brought amazing. two other books. I'm I gonna did. leave Magnolia for a second. Okay, and Magnolia. I want to make sure we yes, uh, did, <laughs> did I say that? did I say Magnolia? You did. Uh, these are titled "Tigers, Artists for Nature in India, and Treasures of the Forgotten Forest." Uh, tell me about these books. Okay, and why you brought them? Okay, this we is have two minutes. Okay, <laughs> oh, two minutes. Uh, this is another project I'm working on. Um, this is a Dutch organization, very interesting, called Artists, the Artists for Nature Foundation. And what they do is they identify a place in the world that re needs uh, conservation attention. Okay, and uh, they 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 assemble some of the best uh, nature artists in the world, go to this place, and then they paint it, draw it, sculpt it. Uh, or whatever, produce a very high-end book like this. Like the Tiger's book. Like this Tiger's book, or the other one that you're holding, which is... Oh, uh, these are both by the same next, organization? The same organization. Okay, I will and hold up, uh, after Tiger's, I yeah. will now hold up yeah. Treasures of the Forgotten Forest with yeah, that beautiful... Is, oh, yeah, Peru oh, and Ecuador. And so like a, a uh, you, can see the, you can see the quality of the art, etc. So I'm working with these folks to do a project like this in Mongolia next spring. So that's why I brought these along. Ah. So there'll be a book. There'll be an exhibit, and the purpose in Mongolia is to raise uh, a major endowment, ten plus million dollars, to support the national park system, which is a project I've been working on for some years with others. Does Mongolia have signs of being overridden yet by mm -hmm. tourism or capitalism? No. Uh, well, in terms of the second part of that, Mongolia has some of the largest reserves of mineral resources in the world. Gold, oh. gold, coal, uh, rare earths, uh, copper, uh, etc. So th the good news is that the Mongolians are very, they're people of the land. So they don't want their land messed up. And so they have been very strict and firm with their legislators in the parliament to, okay, and it, it's a small population, so they can't, they don't have enough people to, you know, uh, do the necessary sort of mining. So, so also the, the, their democracy can function like a real democracy, like a little state like Vermont does, for instance. The, the people know the legislators and, the, and there's, they're responsive right. and there's a real representative feel to it. There is. I mean, not that everybody agrees about everything, but there's a very strong agreement that they don't want to mess up the country and they don't want to give away the country's wealth to people who want to come in and help them develop. So uh, there's great potential there to develop in the right way. Christopher Leahy, I want to thank you for being on the writer's block. I just looked at our clock and we have no more time. I'm sorry to say. We've been talking today with Chris Leahy about his new guidebook, The Birds of Mongolia. If you've learned something about those birds and his experiences in Mongolia, then the writer's block has done its job. I hope to see you again next week on the writer's block. Thanks for being with us and good night.